ADHD, where each week I'm the spotlight on another fabulous or neurodivergent person, not just for ADHD. But very soon, um, Jen has to say. So, welcome, Jen Hodge. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to have you. Thank you for, for coming on. I'd love to um, hear about your story and um, what it is you're about so let's get straight in and maybe tell us where you're from and what it is you do okay so i am based in south somerset in the uk so um not too far about 40 minutes from the coast which is lovely very lucky to be here and i run an alternative education provision called rama life so we work with a lot of neurodivergent young people um, and we run um, all sorts of different activities and groups. Wow. And um, what age groups do you work with? So at the moment, we've worked with different age groups at different times, but at the moment we're mostly working with young people from year, well, from age seven up to about 17. Right. And how long have you been? So I started Rama Life in January 2020. Um a year that is forever embedded in all of our brains. Um, so it was quite an interesting time to be starting a business. So we've been going for just over four years. Wow, yeah, yeah. I, uh, it's the same time I started my business, funnily enough. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's quite a few of us there. So um, well, well, we come back round to a bit more about what you do with your, your education um, provision. Let's find out a bit more about you. So um, tell us about your journey to finding out you were neurodivergent. Okay, so um, I I always used to struggle in school. Um, I was the I was the kind of young person who was already always told that they if they just focused a bit more or did a bit more or put the effort in, then they'd be able to reach their potential. So. I was a non-potential reacher, I think, at school. Um, I talked a lot, very chatty, always being told to be quiet. I um, had a very strong sense of justice and fairness. So that was something I struggled with quite a lot at school when things didn't kind of add up. And um, focusing on subjects that didn't engage me, particularly if the teaching staff weren't engaging, was was really tough. So uh, English used to be something I struggled with a lot. So I, I've always been very eloquent, find talking really easy, and I've always been an avid reader. So it kind of, the fact that I was dyslexic went under the radar and I wasn't actually diagnosed until three months before my GCSEs, which was really unhelpful. Um, so I kind of went my whole childhood on top of the ADHD stuff, which I now know I is my, how my brain works. I didn't know that. Um, but the dyslexia was the first thing to discover. So all those years of being told that I needed to present my best work. And I was like, this is my best work. <laughs> um, and that I was, um, I need to put more effort into spelling. And um, the, the dyslexia assessment basically said that there was no problem re kind of IQ or with, um, reading and understanding, but that my spelling age was that of about an eight-year-old when I was 16. So that was kind of the first thing that got noticed. And then it wasn't until um, three years ago that I received um, my ADHD diagnosis. Um, and it was quite quite an interesting story behind that that I'm happy to share if you'd like me to. Yes, please. Yeah, so yeah. I've spent my whole life knowing that um, I was different, but I didn't know how. So I, I struggled at different times with kind of mental health and feeling good about myself because I didn't fit in the box that people wanted me to fit in. So when I had office jobs, I was always out of my desk. I was always talking to people and walking around and doing different things. And I could be incredible and amazing. And I could also be really useless. So I'd either be really on it and everyone would be like, wow, this is great. 
And then other times it would be like, are you going to wake up now? <laughs> so mm. I'd, I'd spent my whole kind of adult life just feeling rubbish that, okay, on one hand I could do really cool things, but on the other hand, I never had any food in the cupboards and I couldn't, you know, my finances were a mess and all those kind of executive function things. Time blindness, massive issue. I've got, you know, so many, so many tales of the joy of time blindness. So I was, um, I'd started having some therapy. I think therapy is amazing and something that everybody should have every year, at least six weeks. And I was in a, a small course of therapy um, for various reasons. And this conversation kept coming up about self-care and mindfulness, um, which is really a lot of kind of what the therapy was about for me, was, was finding out a way to kind of just um, find some balance. And... Um, we kept having these conversations about taking time out. And I remember my therapist at one point was saying, well, you just you just need a holiday by yourself. And I said, well, yeah, but I'm going to be it's not going to stop the busy, is it? It's not going to stop my brain. And they were like, well, you can just do quiet things. And I was like, what, what about? I don't understand. So on about, you know, the couple of weeks of this conversation, she said, oh, just a minute. And she pulled down a folder off of her um, off of her shelf. And she said, I'm just going to read you some things. These are all just like traits I was going to read them and tell me if any of them resonate with you so she read out this list of about it was about 30 different things it was a lot of different things and it included things that certainly aren't usually in the diagnostic criteria such as have you moved house a lot have you had lots of different jobs have you it, it was it was quite good actually it was far better than the normal um diagnostic criteria and I kind of got to the end and I said well about 99.9 percent of them <laughs> That is true for me. And she said, okay, and um, what does kind of ADHD mean to you? And I was kind of like, I don't know. I, I made I made a very chippy comment about, oh, well, that's what hyperactive children, you know, I, mm -hmm. I, 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 I knew it was more than that, but I was just a bit like, well, what, what, what are you talking, why are you telling me that? Um, and she said, well, you meet, you, you absolutely meet the criteria with bells on. And I was like, it, it was, it was, it was, I don't know, it really, it changed everything. It was a, a huge moment of realisation that there might actually be a reason as to why my brain works the way it does. So I then did, as you would expect, massive hyper-focus. By the next day, I knew everything about ADHD there was to know. <laughs> um, and then I sought... Um, a diagnosis through the right to choose um, scheme, which at the time wasn't oversubscribed because this was before it all kind of became a lot more mainstream headline news that 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 women in their forties might have ADHD. So yeah, it, it was it was a really you know I owe that 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 therapist a huge amount because she absolutely you know it's it's changed my life. Yeah, amazing. And um, yeah, thank goodness she, she you know, brought it up. Yeah, because she doesn't she doesn't actually know she didn't know lots about it. She'd literally seen it in a magazine and thought, oh, that might be useful, put it in a folder and yeah. So it was it was a good process of learning for her as well, because I know that she kind of went on and kind of learnt more about it. Yeah, yeah. And that's why it's so important, isn't it, to have hospitals whether they're online or in magazine mm. and understanding. Wow. So how how are you feeling now, you know, about it? Um, really good. Um, it's been really empowering for me. Um, I'm certainly agree that just getting a diagnosis alone isn't enough to change anything, but I s it's certainly an amazing starting point. Um, for the life that I'd lived, I think because I'd had a trauma background when I was younger, um, I was a young carer, there, there's, there's quite a lot of tricky things, which is why I'd kind of had therapy in the first place, that it was, there was, there was other things, other processes that I needed to get, it was all interlinked, there was a lot of interlinked, but essentially there was a lot of, I'd always just felt so bad about myself, because it had never added up. So once I'd kind of unpicked all the different threads and how things connected together, just that feeling of there's nothing wrong with me. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with me was was incredible. Um, and that was really liberating. And it really 
enabled me because I was already put in the work with the with the um the other the other parts of my life it it was kind of almost the key that just was was a bit of a final oh right brilliant um so I get frustrated with my brain um fairly regularly I still have days where I go oh I <laughs> wish it would work slightly differently but then I think that we probably all do and I think if you sp spoke to anybody neurotypical neurodivergent whatever we all we're, we're not robots are we we all have brains that have got different learned and genetic experiences and traits so knowing knowing what flavor my brain in has just is has just enabled me to then learn the strategies so mm. the last three years have been a huge learning curve um from the kind of beginning stages of oh this is what it is great to then you know um i mean when i first got my diagnosis when i came off came off out of the meeting um i cried and I spent a day just grieving. I think just all of the grief of the life I could have lived. Um, mm. I don't own my own house. I don't. I don't have savings. I don't. There's so many things that are just ADHD taxes that have affected my life, and I yes. felt so shortchanged. But equally, I've got a really strong growth mindset. So it took it. It was just a day, and then it was like right onwards. <laughs> Yeah, which is is quite um quite common in ADHD, is isn't it? It's like um knocked back, you know, grieve whatever, and then let's let's get on with this. Absolutely, make, you know, with a, a growth mindset, you know, that's that's you. Um, it's going to serve you well, I'm sure. So I'm just talk about. When your school reports were like, if only she would try harder or if only she would present her best work, you know, how did that make you feel at the time? It was, um, it was, it was, it was horrible because I wasn't, it wasn't that I was causing loads of problems. So my reports were never, oh, you know, Jen is a problem child because I was able to communicate well, because I was quite confident in a lot of ways it was just that voice of disappointment. It was that, oh, well, if only, if only she could just do this, or if only she could just do this. And the thing is, when you're young, you don't necessarily, you don't always notice. And I know a lot of neurodivergent people have this similar experience. It chips away. It's chips away. And it's about mm -hmm. those negative, you know, those, I don't know how many it is, it's this massive sum of negative comments that a neurodivergent person will get. So it's not something I think that my mum was ever able to counteract because it was all so mm -hmm. subtle, but it added up. And, and it was my, as well as the comments from teachers, and I did look through all my school reports before I had my assessment. It, it's, the, it's, the, it's fitting in with, with, with society as well and realising you're not fitting in, but not understanding why. Um, mm -hmm. And so it it massively damaged my mental health. And it is it is tricky. And I kind of I see now ADHD, and I hate you, I don't generally like this phrase, this whole idea of a superpower. The way I see it with 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 everybody is we've all got strengths and we've always we've all got like a certain level of 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 strength in us, but with ADHD, it you tend to have it like this that you'll have some areas that are up here and some areas that are really low so instead of maybe most people have got this little bit here little bit there we've got this extreme so it's not that we've got more skills than other people we just tend to have the extremes mm. and it's yeah i i think with with taking that into consideration and then a lot of people i know i i see kind of on online who kind of really don't like the idea of superpowers because they're struggling with mental health and it's unpicking the kind of mental health aspect as well which yeah. i think it is so interlinked and those neg all those negative signals negative words teachers friendships relationships connections it all just adds up doesn't it 
um, which is why mm. awareness is so important. It's so important that our young people um, are getting that knowledge early on. So that's what I'm really passionate mm. about is, is those, those primary school children, they need to know how their brain works. So, yeah. so the damage doesn't set in and they're able to to grow and learn who they are and then thrive from it yeah amazing and you lots of students tell me um what's the, what's the story there how did you end up working with alternative education provision i've said that right yeah yeah no so um I've got four children um, and from being kind of a mum to them and seeing their needs, um, at least three of them are neurodivergent, poss possibly four. Um, so growing up and kind of seeing that as a parent growing and seeing their needs and the fact that there wasn't there wasn't enough provision to meet different people's brain types. And this was before I was diagnosed. So this was just mm -hmm. who I was as a person. I worked for kind of a volunteer youth leader for four years and I was seeing how young people who were neurodivergent were just always discriminated against in really subtle ways. So it was the, oh, well, they're not standing still or they need, you know, why can't they stand still? And I'm like, well, because so, some, some people need to move, some people need to, to fidget. But there was a lot of a lot of um a lack of knowledge around around some of the youth leaders who were who were expecting young people to act in a kind of a ordered <laughs> regimented fashion um so from that experience and from the experience of being a parent i was just like oh i want to make i want to have i want to to make something different um i had run a business in the past that was totally not related i had for a year been doing some VA work, which absolutely didn't work for me at all. Um, awful idea. Um, <laughs> I did I did okay in the job, but it 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 just wasn't it wasn't the right mm. right thing for me. The I having to be organized and all that kind of stuff, it, it clearly wasn't the right thing. Because I had admin skills, I was like, okay, I'll do this. So I was kind of at a point of I need to do something. Um I don't want a traditional employment. That's not what I want. Um, I want to be my own boss and I want to create something which is incredible and young people can access. So that's that's kind of how it happened. And I didn't even know really what alternative provision kind of was to, to start with. I kind of knew a bit. Um, and I just literally set up a little holiday club, which had, I think, eight children the first time. And it was it was me and a um you know and, and a couple of other people and it was just in a local kind of community space and then it just grew it just grew from there wow and do you work with students that are kind of part-time in mainstream or special ed yeah absolutely so we have a mixture of young people and that makes us quite unique we work with home educated young children young people um of which is probably at the moment probably 75 percent of the young people we work with but there's now a growing number of young people who are either on school role and not attending or on school role and just needing a bit of extra support so we have we have um connections with quite a lot of local schools that's growing so young people kind of come out to us for maybe a day a week um yeah. for almost respite um yeah. to oh, be yeah. around other neurodivergent folk to be able to learn in a different way yeah and do you find that they're able to kind of unmask and be themselves or i think cases? the the where we see that the most is with our home home educated young people because they come in quite often quite often they'll come in still with the masking because that's what they're used to in a group environment um, unless they've always been home educated, which is a bit different. But to be fair, there's only a few that meet that that criteria. Most have been out in the last few years. But what's lovely is as the weeks go by, because um, we only, you know, they only they're only with us part time. But as as the weeks go by, you then slowly start to see them embrace who they are. 
I think young people who come out of school to us, it's tricky because it holding something together four or five days a week and then suddenly being able to be different. Um, but they certainly seem to relax into it. And um, interestingly, with, with some of the young people we support on a Friday afternoon, they've now had improved outcomes at school because they're not going into the weekend stressed. Wow. So they're not falling out with mates on a Friday afternoon and getting really exhausted and then carrying stress into the weekend and then coming into Monday. So they're actually coming into school on Monday, um, feeling happier, more positive because their week has ended successfully. Um, so that's been really, really interesting and really exciting to be part of. Yeah, that's huge, isn't it? That is mm -hmm. amazing. Oh, thank you. This, this, is there anything else um, that you feel we should know about your your role and your work? Um, I don't know, really. I mean, I suppose, you know, it's really important. I suppose and think something that's really important to me is, is to say to other uh, neurodivergent people who are entrepreneurs or want to be entrepreneurs, it can feel really daunting, I think, because daily life is hard for neurodivergent people. The idea of then taking on the responsibilities of a business and because businesses have so many things that need to happen, but there is support available. And I think by utilising um, kind of the access to work scheme where you can use different, obviously, organisations like This Is Me and other, other agencies to help support you get your application in, even having, I mean, even if you're not able to get that, because I know that can take time, but even mm -hmm. if out of your budget, you can just afford somebody to do an hour a day um, to help you with your admin um, or a volunteer a volunteer who wants to just help you or a friend anybody if you can find someone to just keep an eye on your inbox or help you do those initial setting a business up all of those things um that that overcomes the hurdles because it's the passion and the interest and the experience that people have that make the business and anybody can do the admin that's not that's not the the, the secret source to a business is it so mm -hmm. I suppose it's a case of it's all overcomable um mm -hmm. but it's 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 reaching out to people and getting the support you need and don't be I mean one thing one thing that I realized was a massive um result of my undiagnosed life was the inability to ask for help because I always felt I had to prove myself because I never felt that I really had real value. Um, anything happened, I had to micromanage. I had to solve it myself. I had to, it, it, that became the story of who I was. And that's fine to a point. But when you start running a business, you then get to a point where, well, if you are going to wear every hat, not only are you not going to get the best out of your business, but you're going to burn out and you're going to, yeah, just, just that whole thing of asking for help. So I think um, it can be very easy to define your self-worth by the ability to do everything and not need to ask for help. But yeah. that if you can get over that obstacle and understand that actually you will be, you will get the best version of yourself if you can connect with others, then you're kind of winning. And that's essentially what running, you know, my my view, I have a I have a team of staff, I have um a growing business, we have lots going on, but I am I see myself as the bringer together of all the people. I don't see myself as I'm not up here and everybody else is down here. Yeah. I'm the kind of the commonality that brings them together and then I can get the best enabling them to do the best that they do in their thing, which then creates this amazing organization. So yeah, just be open to help, accept it, ask for it, take it and um, yeah, give it a go. Yeah, and that is such a, an important part of as so many people and myself would, would never ask for help, you know, I've got to do it all myself, I can't be a burden, you know, all those awful things that, we often think um and i guess that would would apply to people 
in their everyday life as well, wouldn't it? Huh? So getting you some out there. Yeah, I think unfortunately our society um our society has many problems, but this certainly this idea that we're all um you know, we're all these little individual islands and that we don't, you know, there's no, we don't live in a society anymore that kind of encourages people to be communities in themselves of relying on, you know, we, it used to be that when you raised children that, that you would have people close by and people had time off work, not everybody wasn't working full time. And now we have a society where parents are being pushed in to get back to work as soon as possible access you know statutory child care or commercial things and we're, we don't have that so much of that day-to-day -day connection with our our local community and mm -hmm. I think that that just encourages that idea that we all need to be um achieving and then you add in your kind of social media where we're all seeing pictures of everybody being awfully successful um and and so I think it's easy for for humans to really feel that we're um we're supposed to be you know doing everything and doing it perfectly yeah yeah like a, a load of robots yeah brilliant thank you so much if people want to find out more about what it is you do how can they get in touch with you so uh if you just google rama life um we are we are we we come up straight away and also myself so i am now doing um quite a lot of videos um, I'm on TikTok and Facebook and have my own website. So the life experiences I've had and running the business, I'm now also moving into um, more kind of public speaking, motivational speaking and really kind of education on um, young people, neurodivergent young people, how to support them um, and getting the word out there. So lots of different ways to connect with me and it would be yeah, lovely to hear from people. Brilliant. Thank you so much for coming along and sharing. That's been absolutely lovely. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.